Hello, I'm Andy Hill, and I'm going to talk to you today about internal instability. Overview of the internal erosion process. Internal instability describes the loss of soil particles as a result of seepage. Finer particles in the soil are able to move within the soil mass under the forces imposed on the particles by seepage flow. Confusion and confusion. Various terms have been associated with the internal erosion process due to internal instability, leading to confusion and confu confusion which is a play on the two modern terms shown on the next slide. Some classic definitions. This slide presents two classic definitions for the internal erosion process due to internal instability. A couple of key modern concepts appear in these classic definitions. With suffusion, the volume of the internally unstable soil layer is unchanged and suffusion involves mass erosion due to seepage flow. Modern definitions. This slide presents modern definitions. Suffusion, larger particles are classed supported. If finer particles erode, larger particles remain in place. Suffusion, larger particles are floating in a matrix of finer particles. If finer particles erode, larger particles settle into space left by smaller particles. Mechanics. This slide examines the differences in the mechanics between suffusion and suffusion. Suffusion. Since larger particles are class supported, effective stresses do not load finer particles. Although finer fraction erodes, there is no volume change, but permeability increases due to remnant coarser skeleton. Suffusion, since larger particles are matrix supported, effective stresses load the finer particles. Therefore, large hydraulic gradients such as 20 or 30 are needed for erosion and major movement to occur. If erosion does occur, volume change can result in sinkholes or deformation and overlying embankments. Mechanics continued. Garner and Fannin developed the Venn diagram shown on this slide to illustrate that particle detachment occurs with the unfavorable coincidence of a critical geometric condition, stress condition, and hydraulic load. The critical geometric condition requires the size of finer soil particles be smaller than the size of the constrictions between coarser particles. The critical stress condition requires the effective stresses to be transferred by the coarser particles only, leaving some particles free to move. Mechanics continued. The critical hydraulic condition requires the velocity of flow through the soil matrix to be high enough to overcome the particle weight the finer soil particles and to move them through the constrictions between the larger soil particles. Contributing mechanism. We are not aware of any case histories leading to breach. Therefore, suffusion is considered a secondary mechanism that can lead to one of the primary processes of internal erosion. Suffusion first results in an increase in permeability, greater seepage velocities, and under potentially higher hydraulic gradients, accelerating rate of suffusion. It can then lead to transport of substantial amounts of fines that may cause clogging and occasionally hydraulic fracture. Top left, sloughing of the downstream slope due to increased seepage flows in higher permeability shell after washout. Top middle and right, settlement or sinkholes may occur as the overlying adjacent finer materials are eroded into the remnant coarser matrix. And the bottom, filter constricted, constri excuse me, filter constructed of internally unstable soil will have potential for erosion of finer particles in filter, rendering the filter coarser and less effective in protecting the core materials 
and concentrated leak erosion. WAC Bennett Dam Incident 1996. On the left, BC Hydro's WAC Bennett Dam is a 182 meter high, two kilometer long zoned earth fill embankment dam located on the Peace River in northeastern British Columbia that retains the very large Williston Reservoir. The dam was constructed almost entirely of well compacted glacial moraines, which were sorted and blended to form core, transition, filter, and shell zones. In 1996, after 28 years of reliable operation, two sinkholes emerged on and upstream of the dam crest. Investigations revealed that the core materials beneath the sinkholes were heavily disturbed down to bedrock, indicating that silty and widely graded soils may be susceptible to internal erosion. On the right, the sinkhole at the crest measured two and a half meters in diameter and was seven meters deep. An extremely loose zone was encountered to a depth of 80 meters, with a variable zone to a depth of 125 meters. The remediation method selected was compaction grouting, a method which injects at a drained rate columns of stiff grout bulbs into the damaged core material at very high pressure, about 7,000 kPa. A key consideration for selection of this method was its ability to reestablish some of the stresses that were lost. WAC Bennett Dam Gradations. BC Hydro's WAC Bennett Dam is a well-known and heavily studied case history. All materials came from moraine pits, which were deficient in medium sands, or the range shown in red. While the wide, blended, till-like core was internally unstable, the transition and filter materials were gap graded in the medium sand range. The coarse portion of the soils is shown in the photograph at the bottom right. Broadly graded core dams. I Cold Bulletin 164 from 2017 refers to a process termed global backward erosion in which stoping can lead to the development near vertical cavity within broadly graded silty sand and gravel non-plastic cores of embankments leading to sinkholes. This term is confusing and not used by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Sinkholes are a product of suffusion as discussed on the previous slide. Filters can be internally unstable, resulting in too coarse a gradation for particle retention, and the core erodes into the filter, leading to stoping and collapse of overlying rock fill, manifested as a sinkhole. The core can also be internally unstable. Available Evidence Central Core Dams The available evidence on central core dams is that internal erosion will only occur at relatively high gradients except when the core consists of cohesionless, internally unstable soils subject to suffusion or when large cavities are in contact with the core. Filters must be designed to protect the fine material that can erode from the broadly graded matrix. Susceptibility screening. A quick examination of the shape of the gradation curve is an easy but important first step. Broadly graded soils. Sherard, in his 1979 paper, plotted a band around gradations judged to be internally unstable from sinkholes in dams of coarse, broadly graded soils, where internally unstable soil gradations usually plotted as nearly straight lines or as curves with only slight curvature within the range shown. Sherard's method is empirically based and designed to identify soils which will not self filter which is a different process than internal instability. However, non-self-filtering, very broadly graded soils, such as glacial soils, that fall into the gradation envelope are also susceptible to internal, internal instability. Internally unstable gradations. Look for characteristics of gap-graded soil or broadly graded soil with a flat tail of fines. These include widely graded or gap graded cohesionless soils in alluvium or large of a large river, colluvium in the bed of rivers in mountainous areas, embankment cores constricted of glacial origin soils, 
as well as filters with very broad or gap gratings or excessive fines content. A gap graded soil is one defined by a broad gradation in which a distinct portion is significantly underrepresented or completely absent. USBR DS13-5 Protective Filters. Reclamation discusses a four times line in their DS-13-5 protective filters. It's shown here along with Sherrard's instability bands. It's a slope line, not a boundary. So any portions of a gradation curve steeper than the line indicates a stable soil. The 4X line is the same as Terzaghi in 1939 and Kinney and Lau in 1986 criteria of H over F less than one, which will be discussed later. Plasticity considerations. For practical purposes, non-dispersive soils with a PI greater than seven should be considered not subject to suffusion at gradients usually experienced in dams and their foundations. If for some particular reason, the gradient is higher than about four, then non-dispersive soils with a PI less than or equal to 12 should be considered for suffusion. This was considered to be a somewhat conservative approach. Let's talk about some geometric conditions for initiation. Two common geometric criteria. Two criteria are commonly used to assess the susceptibility to internal instability with a granular soil that is subject to seepage flow. Casey, 1969 and 1979's papers, and says the slope is flatter than 15% per four times change in grain, grain size. Kinney and Lau, in their 1985 and 1986 papers, said the slope is flatter than F% percent per four times change in the grade, grade, grain size. Both methods require similar mathematical expressions where the secant slope of the grain size distribution curve indicates the likelihood of internal instability. Kesdi divided the soil into a coarse fraction and a fine fraction at one point along its particle size distribution curve and applied Terzaghi's rule for designing protective filters of D15 of the filter over D85 of the base should be less than four to the two fractions, treating the fine fraction as the base and the coarse fraction as the filter to determine if the soil would be self-filtering and would thus be internally stable. The mass increment H over D15 and D85 is constant and equal to 15%, thus the criterion of H is less than 15%. Kenny and Lau calculated the H over F stability index over the increment D to 4D, which increases in magnitude with progression along the gradation curve, where H is the mass increment and F is the mass passing. They ultimately defined potentially internally untable, unstable soils based on H over F is less than 1.0 and F less than or equal to 20% for widely graded soils or F less than or equal to 30% for narrowly graded soils. Lee and Fannin, 2008. Application of the two methods to the literature database shows the two methods have mixed success in assessment of internal, insta of internal stability for gap graded and widely graded soils. These observations led to an investigation of combining some aspects of the two empirical methods. Unified approach. Lee and Fannin in their 2008 paper proposed a unified approach combining the methods of Kesdi and Kinney and Lau. Example HF space conversion. The unified approach requires converting the cumulative particle size distribution or the, grade, or the grading curve from FD space to a shape curve in FH space where D is the particle size, F is the mass, pa mass passing, and H is the mass increment. 
First two columns are cumulative particle size curve. The third column is four times T. Fourth column obtains the mass passing, or F, for 4D by interpolating on D in the first column. Fifth column obtains H by subtracting F, second column, from F4D, the fourth column. Example grading curve and shape curve. On the left, particle size distribution or grading curve from the previous example, and on the right, the equivalent shape curve in FH space showing only F less than or equal to 40%, which is of interest for internal instability. Here's an example evaluation. If the CU of a soil is greater than three, then the soil is well graded. Use F less than or equal to 20% criterion to define the unstable boundary with H over F less than one and H less than 15%. On the left, the soil is gap graded with a range of particle deficiency between 0.3 and 2.8 millimeters. On the right, five particle sizes translated to FH space plot in the unstable zone. Burenkova 1993. Burenkova, in their 1993 paper, proposed a predictive method based on the results of laboratory tests of cohesionless sand gravel soils with maximum particle sizes up to 100 millimeters and coefficients of uniformity up to 200. According to Burenkova, the internal stability of a soil depends on the conditional factors of uniformity H double prime and H prime. Boundaries were defined separating suffusive soils from non-suffusive soils. Zones 1 and 3 represent zones of suffusive compositions. Zones two, zone 2 represents a zone of non-suffusive compositions. Zone 4 represents a zone of artificial soils. Modified Burenkova method. Wan and Fell believed that, the mo that most dam engineers in Australia and USA used methods of Kinney and Lau from 1985 in their 1986 papers, or Sherrard from his 1979 paper, to assess internal instability. Even if so the soil is sand silt gravel or clay silt sand gravel, they do so not knowing if the methods they are using are conservative or otherwise. Due to the poor predictive ability of existing methods for silt sand gravel and clay silt sand gravel soils, improved methods were developed. Different approaches were trialed using statistical methods varying the combination of particle size parameters and the compaction density. In order to increase the size of the database on which the methods are based, laboratory test data from other authors was also included in the with the University of New South Wales test data to obtain methods that were best able to identify internally unstable soils. Because Bjorn-Kova method does not give a clear-cut boundary between internally stable and unstable soils in the data set, Wan and Fell used logistic regression equation, used, used logistic regression to define the contours of equal probability of internal instability. This slide presents the relationship for silt, sand, gravel soils, and clay, silt, sand, gravel soils of limited plasticity and clay content. How does the regression, represented by the probability lines, really fit the test data? Modified Burenkova method continued. This slide represents the relationship for sand, gravel soils with less than 10% non-plastic fines. How does the regression, represented by the probability lines, really fit, really fit this test data? Wannenfell 2008 Alternative Method Experience in using the modified Burenkova method led Wan and Fell to realize that soils with a steep slope on the coarse fraction and a flat slope on the finer fraction were likely to be internally unstable. 
After some trials, it was determined that these could be represented by D90 over D60 and D20 over D5. This figure shows the two boundaries, one beyond which likelihood of internal instability is low, and the other defining an area in which soils are highly likely to be internally unstable. This method is not able to identify internal instability of gap graded soils. Suggested geometric criteria. Moreau et al. in their 2014 paper presented the following suggested criteria for assessing internal instability. Use Kesdi's criterion for gap graded soils. Use Kinney and Lau's criterion for broadly graded soils with F less than 15%. Use Kesdi's criterion for F greater than 15%, according to Lee and Fan in 2008, and use Wan and Fell's criteria or the alternative method for broadly graded silt, sand, gravel soils with F greater than 15%, based on Moreau et al. 2014. Comments on geometric criteria. Available methods for identifying internally unstable soils rely on simple combinations of particle sizes from the particle size distribution of the soil. They do not provide a clear demarcation between internally unstable and stable soils, and they are based on relatively small number of sample particle size distributions. Comments on geometric criteria. Small variations in the shape of the particle size distribution can affect whether or not a soil is stable or unstable. It is essential to test the actual gradations in the embankment rather than using mean or average gradations. Be aware that there is a potential for segregation during construction or placement in laboratory test equipment. Always avoid scalping large particles out of the sample to allow them to fit in the test equipment and ensure you use the proper degree of saturation as well as the proper compaction technique. Now let's talk about some hydraulic conditions for initiation. Hydraulic criteria. The hydraulic loading on the soil grains is often described by three distinct approaches, hydraulic gradient, hydraulic shear stress, and pore velocity. Likelihood of initiation. There is little published literature on the critical gradient to initiate suffusion. Figures on the right show the results of upward vertical flow testing carried out by University of New South Wales and from Skimpton and Brogan. Internally unstable soils began to erode under upward vertical seepage gradients of 0.8 or less. There appears to be a relationship to porosity with looser, higher porosity soils beginning to erode internally at gradients less than 0.3. It will be noted that tests on the same soil carried out at different porosities resulted in different gradients at which erosion of the fine particles began. In practice, <clears throat> erosion pathway is horizontal surface and the flow lines are near vertical. Therefore, erosion is probably more likely in the horizontal direction. Comments on hydraulic criteria. According to Fell et al. in their 2004 paper, more laboratory testing is needed with a wider range of soils placed at varying void ratios and tested at a range of hydraulic gradients. Tests are also needed with flow horizontal and inclined to better define the gradients at which erosion initiates. So in general, uh, there are no generalized methods for accurately predicting the critical seepage gradient. There's been little research to assess the effects of flow direction on the critical gradient. And in many of the in internally unstable soils tested, the gradients to initiate internal erosion are so high, they are unlikely to occur in dams, levees, or their foundations. General observations, critical gradient. That being said, here are some general observations on the critical hydraulic gradient for initiation. Selective erosion of fine soil particles begins at gradients less than the Terzaghi critical or zero effective stress gradient. No, def no definite relationship has been identified between the critical gradient and the coefficient of uniformity, stability index, minimum HF ratio, fine content, or porosity. 
This slide presents some observations on the influence of soil properties on suffusion. Soils with a higher porosity start to erode at a lower hydraulic gradients. Soils with clay fines erode at relatively higher hydraulic gradients than soils without clay fines at similar fine contents. Soils with higher soil density erode at higher, criti higher critical gradients, given fines contents of the, same, of the soils are the same. And gap-graded soils erode at relatively lower critical gradients than non-gap-graded soils with similar fines contents. Now let's talk some more and less likely factors. More and less likely factors. This table can be used to help assess the likelihood of a soil being susceptible to internal instability, such as it addresses the geometric conditions only. This table can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project specific more likely and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. A few sample more and less likely factors include widely graded or gap graded cohesionless soils in alluvium of a large river, colluvium in the bed of rivers and mountainous areas, embankment cores constructed of glacial origins, or on the less likely side, geometric conditions for susceptibility to internal instability are not present, uh, Non-dispersive soils with a PI greater than 7 at gradients usually experienced in dams and their foundations. Now let's go through a toolbox overview. Filter considerations. An internally unstable filter would ha will have a potential for erosion of the finer particles in the filter, rendering the filter coarser and less effective in protecting the core materials from erosion. Evaluate the susceptibility of the filter to internal instability and then assess the likelihood and adjusted gradation as part of the continuation node using the RMC filter evaluation for a continuation toolbox. Worksheets. The toolbox assesses geometric condition for initiation only. So the toolbox, like the others, is an Excel spreadsheet and it contains several worksheets uh, laid out on this slide right here. So it talks, it takes a look at general requirements informed by Sherrard 1979 and Fell et al. in 2008. Another worksheet looks at the unified approach for gap graded and broadly graded cohesion of soils according to Lee and Fannin in 2011. Um, an alternative method for broadly graded silt, sand, gravel soils based on Wadden Fell 2008. The modified Burenkova method, uh, Wadden Fell 2008, as well as the Burenkova 1993 method. And here are some of the references. <laughs> 